This is the SAU Report, a program featuring interviews with the faculty, staff, students, and alumni of Southern Arkansas University in Magnolia. Welcome to this special edition of the SAU Report. I'm Amanda Black. And I'm Lisa Stegall. With us today is a very special guest, country music recording artist Tracy Lawrence. He's a former SAU student and he's Grand Marshal of the 1998 Homecoming Parade. Thank you for joining us, Tracy. It's great to be here today. How are you doing? Good. How does it feel to be back on the SAU campus? I haven't actually had enough time to look around and, and check the campus out. I drove through late last night, so I'm uh, just now getting started looking forward to making my way around the campus and seeing what's changed. Uh, I noticed some new facilities here, but uh, it's, it's been several years since I've been back, so I'm looking forward to looking around after the game's over today and kind of soaking it all in. Uh, while you were at Southern Arkansas University, uh, you too were a student of mass mm -hmm. communications, I believe in business. Yes. Um, what do you see yourself doing in that field if you hadn't been the successful star that you are today? Well, the reason that I chose mass communications was because I was looking for an avenue to get into the recording industry. Uh, being from this area, I felt like I was very limited with the you know, the people and the contacts that I had to get into that field, and I felt like a background in mass communications was a good, solid way to prepare for it. And it has been a very good step in getting to that point. But I, I would probably be in radio of sorts, probably a disc jockey or a program director somewhere. Uh, definitely music is without a doubt one of the most important things in my life. But the background, even though I don't use it in the field that I started out studying, gave me a, a lot of foundation for media preparations and learning how to work in front of the camera, um, dealing with radio stations and understanding the structure of the format that I deal with in my business. So it was uh, a lot more educational than I even realized at the time. So music's definitely your first love. Without a doubt, yes. I know you're here for Homecoming today, mm -hmm. and I've read that you've done, I think, three Homecoming concerts in your hometown of Foreman? Yes. Uh, last year, uh, Sammy Kershaw was with me the year before Kenny Chesney. Actually, we've done four. The year before that, Lisa Brokaw was there, and the, and the first year that we had it, uh, Tracy Bird performed with me. Uh, and we actually do a scholarship fund for a, a high school student out of Foreman. We've given three away, I believe, and we, we believe that we're going to get it up to a full four-year scholarship this year for one of the students there. The rest of the money goes into the local community, uh, to the football program. We've bought computers for the school. Uh, different things around the town, you know, everything goes right back into the economy. That's great. Any plans for a scholarship for mass comm students at <laughs> SAU? <laughs> you know, I would love to be able to get this uh, to a point where it would be more of a music geared scholarship, something into the mass communications mm -hmm. field or the music department, uh, but the type of money we're talking about, I mean, it's still growing. It takes a while to get to that point. Uh, Concerts are pretty expensive to put on. Well, it looks like so, you've got a good start. Yeah, well, we do. With all the glitz and glamour that surrounds you, I mean, you grew up in Foreman, you fished in the Little and Red Rivers. Yes. Um, how do you stay grounded? You know, I think uh, being able to come back home uh, and I've maintained uh, contact with my friends from college and from high school, just the relationships. Uh, of the previous years before I went to Nashville have been very beneficial in keeping me grounded. Uh, my family has been very supportive and very strong. And I, I think more than anything it's just having the ability to come home and, and just be the same guy I was when I left. Well, what's it like coming home? Are you, are you mobbed by people or do you, do you feel comfortable being in your own hometown? I do. Uh, concert week uh, is usually pretty crazy when I'm home that week. But for the most part, I have a place uh, down by my mom and dad. I just relax when I come home. My, my friends from high school come by and see me. And, I mean, it's very low key. There's not a lot of people in form, you've got to understand. I think there were <laughs> 1,200 people there when I graduated high school, and it may have declined some from then. But it's, uh, I think, for the most part, everybody pretty much accepts me and, and uh, receives me back into the town as just one of their own. They're very supportive and, and pretty much give me my space. Through your celebrity, I guess that would have opened a few doors and offered you the opportunity to maybe explore some, maybe some activities or things that you might not have pursued otherwise. How do you think your celebrity has maybe changed you? I think it's changed everything about me in great respect. Um, it's forced me to mature. 
uh, at, a, at a very accelerated rate. Uh, I, I, would n I wouldn't have been exposed to the, the people or the, just the overwhelming mass of people that, that really have, have given me a better perspective of, of just how people are overall in the country, socially, spiritually. Uh, it, it's really giving me a lot better overview just simply because of the mass of people that I've dealt with in the last six or seven years. You know, millions and millions of people with hand-to-hand -hand contact. Uh, you, you really start to get a better grip on, you know, I, I'm very much a, a studier or evaluator of people and, and groups and, and how people react to situations. I, I, I'm a, a deep thinker from a great degree. But um, I think it really has been something that, that as I look and reflect back over the last six or seven years, uh, I've learned a lot of things that I would have never been exposed to without this. So would you consider that one of the, the better things about being a celebrity? I think there are pros and cons to anything. You know, Definitely anything that's, uh, that you desire is worth hard work. And, and there's a lot of long hours, a lot of uh, short nights. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I think for what you sacrifice, you gain a great deal because it's, it's allowed me the opportunity to, to leave my mark in a way that hopefully will be remembered for many, many years because the music will be there for a long time. What about um, drawbacks to being a celebrity? Would you, when you see your name in a tabloid or something, do you get mad or do you laugh about it? Or? Um, I really don't read tabloids. <laughs> um, I, I think after a point, once you get used to the initial shock of it, there comes a point where you just learn to let it roll off. It's just part of the job. And uh, either you let it consume you or you conquer it. And it's just one of those things that you have to deal with. I mean, you are so exposed to the press and, and the media that if you choose the lifestyle, you have to be ready to deal with the downsides and the repercussions of all of it because most people in the industry are going to have to deal with it to some degree. Uh, and you have to realize that, that none of it is personal. It's just all business. Everybody's just doing their job and just accept it for what it is. It's just an industry. It's, a, it's an avenue of advertising, one that I, I would prefer not to use. But uh, any press is good press. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> what about your songwriting? This is jumping to a new um, subject, but do you write a lot of your songs? I do. Uh, I'm actually uh, working on my new album right now. I've been writing a lot. I uh, don't have a working title for it yet, but we expect that uh, I'll go back in probably February of this next year and start cutting my next record. So we should have it finished and out on the streets by uh, May or June. Uh, as far as songs that I've written, uh, I wrote uh, If the World Had a Front Porch. I wrote Can't Break It to My Heart. Stars Over Texas. Uh, my goodness, I can't remember. Uh, quite a few. I had five things on the Coast is Clear album that I wrote. Uh, How Cowgirl Says Goodbye was one of mine. Uh, four things on Time Marches On that I was a writer on. And anticipate that I'll probably write the biggest portion of my next record. When composing songs today, um, I, I wonder now with high tech and TNN and all the, the different avenues for music videos, are songs composed with a music video in mind or is it vice versa? Uh, I think that's just another step in the process. Um, a song pretty much the level of industry that we're in has to stand on its own. Um, a strong song pretty much will dictate where it needs to go for a video. But I don't think you can go in with a conception and write from a video perspective. Uh, the video should just be a, a tool that expresses the song, but it shouldn't be what the song is about. To me, music music is not visual. It's an emotional thing and it has to be felt. Uh, and video is a reflection of the mind's eye, but it shouldn't spell everything out so precisely that it takes away the imagination of what people want to perceive themselves out of the song. I noticed that a lot of your videos have a running theme in them. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered crossing over into acting? Uh, yes, there has been some talk about it. Um, I just don't think that I would want to take the time to uh, do a, a full movie or anything like that. I, it's not anything that I have a great passion for. I did some theater in college. Uh, I'm actually uh, going to be able to, to do a couple of weeks on Broadway this next year with a play that I produced a soundtrack for called The Civil War that's in Houston right now. 
but if if I do something as far as movies or anything, it will be many years down the road because it would be very time consuming and it's, I, I don't want to be distracted from making music right now. It's my first love. When um, you listen to a lot of country music artists today, uh, you often notice that, and this is a criticism I've heard from, from some people, that, well, it doesn't sound like country music anymore. It's almost like it's bastardized the country music it's process, generic. and it's crossed over to, it sounds too much like pop. Yes. How do you stay focused and, and make sure that, because it, it would easy, be easy to cross over and have that mass appeal, I guess, and possibly sell more albums to a different audience? I, I try to be very frank and direct when people ask me that. I, I don't want to be a pop artist. Uh, I have a strong country fan base, uh, and I think country fans are some of the most loyal of any music format in the country. Uh, they're not fickle like a pop or a rock crowd that shifts from artist to artist. Once they become fans, they stay with you for many years. Uh, but you have to nurture that relationship that you have with them, and that's one of the great things about the country industry. We have that we're much more accessible than most other fields of music, uh, and I think we do that by choice because we want relationships with our fans. I think it's a very important, integral part of our business. Uh, I, I don't think I would be happy if I grew to the point that I was so large that I couldn't remain accessible to my fans. I don't think that that's a, a price that I'm willing to pay. Well, let me ask you something about um, touring. I know the South is, among other things, known for country music. Mm -hmm. Is it a different experience playing down here than it is in the North? Oh, I don't think you can make a black and white statement about that as far as regions of the country. Uh, we're pretty much country over the last several years has become very prominent across the board from Washington State to Florida to New York City all the way to California and everywhere in between through the uh, Farm Belt and the Bible Belt in the middle of the country. Uh, but what I do notice is that uh, different areas of the country that have a strong uh, nationality of people, for instance, uh, places up in the northeast, northeast where there's a heavy German population tend to be a little more reserved and don't uh, <laughs> they don't show excitement like other parts of the country, say as South Louisiana would. So you do feel a difference depending on the type of people that are in the area. And that's one of the things that I've, I've really been able to notice as I've traveled and seen the masses around the country from coast to coast. Of course, California is one of the most liberal places that we play. Uh, Texas is, is, is one of my favorites because of the night circuit, nightclub circuit that you're able to play, uh, but they, they all have their own flavor and appeal to them. Um, you've also branched out and are doing producing, and, and I've noticed on one of the websites that y'all are uh, recruiting different singers and, and putting them on a label. Um, it's been said not only about the country music industry, but the music industry as a whole, that more often than not today, it's they're packaging people. It's models and guitars. And what are you doing to make sure that that, that true sound, that, uh, that musical talent, is something that's chosen over a pretty face and a guitar? You know, that's been a problem that I've, I've confronted within my industry. Uh, I'll give you an example. There is a very dear friend of mine, and I won't mention names because he's from close to here. But to me, he's one of the best singers in the business. Uh, but he's a little overweight, and he's lacking a little hair on top. And he's, you know, pushing the late thirties, and nobody will touch him. And he's one of the best singers in the business. And I believe that his voice is the type of voice that, if it was offered to the people, that they would like it. But because of his, the way that he looks, he's been refused the opportunity to do that. And I've tried for many years to get him a record deal, and we finally accepted the fact that it's not going to happen. Um, you know, and you see kids coming into town that are early twenties. Obviously, they're more marketable because they're more easily controlled. They don't want someone that has three or four children that's in later stages of life, that's, that's looking for more financial security, that's not running up and down the roads, and you know, that's not willing to go out there and work 300 days a year and stay on the road and make the sacrifices that are required to break at that stage of your career. They want someone young and aggressive and gung-ho and willing to go out there that's not tied down and don't have anything restricting them. I think that 
is more of the reason that they go for the younger looking people is because they have more energy and they're willing to get more, out, they're willing to work more and they don't have to put as much money into them in all reality. So is there anything you would tell somebody that's thinking about heading off to Nashville and looking for a music career? I think the one thing that, that I've always tried to hold on to is, um, and it's been difficult at times, is just to maintain the fact that, that I came to Nashville strictly for music. There was no other reason that I went. I went for a passion for country music. And if I wasn't performing, I would be writing or working in that industry in some shape, form, or fashion. Um, you can't sacrifice yourself for it I mean, because, you know, you they'll try to talk you into cutting all kinds of different songs for one reason or another. You're the one that has to sing them. Stay true to your music uh, because you may have to stand on stage and sing them for 20, 30 years of your life. And if you let people hustle you into talk into cutting things that you really don't like, that you don't feel strongly about, just for the sake of a hit record, you're not going to be very happy singing those songs for the rest of your life. Uh, you've, you've got to do it for the right reasons. Keep your integrity intact. In the early days of country music and recording artists, uh, so much of that experience was tied so d closely and directly to the American experience as well. Uh, where do you see country music uh, headed today? You know, it's really softened up. Uh, the whole industry has, has declined. Uh, we've lost radio stations around the country. And I think a lot of that is due to the, the generic flavor that's coming off the radio. Uh, the safe zone is what I'm learning to call it. Everybody's afraid to step out and take chances. Uh, and if you notice, the few people that are still selling a lot of records or are doing good concert numbers, they're the ones that are that are standing out on the edge and taking the chances. People like Shania Twain, you know, even Garth Brooks' album sales are way down from what they were just a few years ago. That mass appeal and that newness has worn off. Um, I think the one thing that our industry needs now is just someone to step up and become the icon of our industry again. We don't really have a, a figure artist standing out front that's really setting a tone and a sound for our industry. Everything's getting a little bland. Uh, but it's going through a, a cycle and a phase that's, that I think every industry has to go through. You know, this has been our turn for about the last 10 years. Uh, and it will cycle back again in the next few years. People shift formats. I know I'm, I'm a puncher myself. I go, I listen to pop and rock and everything else. So you, you do burn out on the sameness. Uh, but I, I think once it cycles out, we'll condense down. People will shift to pop, we'll lose a few stations. Three or four years from now, it will all swing back and we'll begin the momentum again. It just needs a cool off period. Uh, I think that has been something that we've all foreseen coming for some time that you just have to accept as part of the natural cycle of the business. Where do you see yourself in that evolution? Hanging on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've, been, I've had a pretty successful track record. Uh, I, I should be pretty stable for as many years as I want to perform. Um, I want to be more on the cutting edge, uh, more of a traditional st style of music. I, I, I think I want to, I, I really want to make music that, that stays with people for a while. I, I don't want to say I'm not, I don't want to cut We Are the World and that kind of stuff, <laughs> but I want it to, to reach the people that I, I feel like I'm connected with, you know, the people, the places that I've been and where I come from. I want to, I want to make music that speaks and says something. I know with your song, Time Marches On, I really enjoyed it and I could identify with some of it. Mm -hmm. Do you incorporate a lot of personal experiences into it and, and what's your inspiration? You know, songs are like children. Each one has its own personality and its own style and you have to let it be what it is because some of them are good and some of them are bad. And a lot of the bad ones never come out of the closet to keep them locked up in the basement like Carl. <laughs> <and>, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you just have to realize that every song that you write can't be creative. Every song that you, every song that you write can't be a hit record. Every song that you record is not going to be a hit record. And when you go into the studio or you write, you have to let it become what the best it can be and just let it go where it needs to go. It's like writing a poem. You can't, you can't squish it into a little box. You just have to let it be what it is. That's, that's the reason that it's so hard to pick an album title 
uh, or really go in and just cut 10 songs for a record, you need to give yourself breathing room and have more choices to pick so you'll put a better package together. Usually I'll cut almost 20 songs for an album and choose the best 10 out of it. Well, let me get back to a little SAU related okay. stuff here. Got <laughs> did you perform at any local hangouts here? I did a jamboree here one time, uh, an old church going out toward a, the country club, I believe. I don't even remember what it was called. Uh, I was actually here on a choir scholarship. I sang uh, in the choral ensemble. I remember the powder blue tuxedos <laughs> very well. Uh, Let's see, I played at the Pines quite often, played uh, a lot in Spring Hill, but that was really after I left Magnolia when I moved to Louisiana. Um, I, I think I did one frat party the whole time I was here. It wasn't a very country-oriented university at the time. Yeah. I did get a lot of the college parties with Sigma Pi, I was a Sigma Pi, but it, most of it wasn't country. I had to kick and scream to get them to play in the George Street. <laughs> <laughs> Well, every day fans are surrounding you, hoping for a chat or an autograph. Uh, who's the person that you've met since you've been a celebrity that, that made you regress to a, a starstruck groupie? Well, I don't go as far as saying I'm a starstruck groupie, but it makes me nervous. <laughs> uh, and I've had an opportunity to chat with him and work with him several times. But he is, uh, he's the reason that I chose this professional. He inspired me and influenced me very heavily his music and his style and you know I think he was way ahead of his time in the early 80s he has been a great inspiration to me and and I, I wish that I had had the opportunity to meet Keith Whitley before he passed away it was one of the things that I do regret I've met just about everybody else in the business and worked with Haggard and George Jones and all of them uh, and I feel very fortunate that I've had to do I've gotten an opportunity to, to meet and work with those guys because they've you know they've been the backbone of, of what we call country now um, you've received a lot of awards since coming on the music scene. Um, top new male vocalist in 1993, uh, 95 video recording artist of the year. Have you said to yourself, I finally made it, or is that a continual process? I think my definition of what made it is has changed several times through the last seven years. Uh, I thought I'd made it when I had my first number one record. I mean, you know, you. And then you realize the financial strains that come along with, with being a touring artist and the cost of buses and, and the overhead of employees and salaries and all the things that go into it. You know, I think at this stage of life, making it to me is, is true happiness and being becoming very settled. Um, it doesn't have as many career strings attached to it as it used to. Uh, I've, I'm, I'm past the point of of feeling like I have to conquer the world and trying to kick down every door I come across. And I felt that way for a long time, you know, as a, you know, when you get opportunities that come your way, my natural tendency, tendencies are to get in every door that you can because it might not be open in five years. Uh, but I, I feel like I've accomplished everything that I've ever wanted to do at this stage of life. But at the same time, you can't let yourself become complacent and just accept it. I mean, you have to keep looking for new avenues. So you have to reinvent yourself and re-motivate yourself. It's very important to continue to move forward and not just become content with what's going on around you because I don't feel like I've accomplished all that I'm capable of in my lifetime. Uh, but, you know, if it stops right now, I can be happy. Well, we'll be eager to see what awaits the next uh, 20 years for Tracy Lawrence. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us today. We've really enjoyed it. I'm Lisa Stegall. And I'm Amanda Black. Thank you. The SAU Report is a production of broadcast journalism students in the Department of Theater and Mass Communication at Southern Arkansas University in Magnolia.